All right. So we decreased preload, we decreased afterload, we decreased both preload and afterload. All right. Now, anotropy. This is a systolic heart failure we're talking about now. It's not uh, ejecting blood despite the high heart rate and the high preload. So what do we do? Uh, we have several options to uh, use as inotropes. Dobutamine is one that I like. <laughs> now, it acts on the beta-1 receptor, but it's a subset of the beta-1 receptor. All right, remember beta-1 receptors increase heart rate and increase contractility. They're positive inotropes, okay? So why not just give these animals epinephrine? Well, the inotropy is true, will increase, that's good, but the heart rate is gonna go sky high. And the high heart rate is gonna increase the oxygen demands on the heart, and we do not want that. So what we're looking for in an inotrope is something that stimulates the beta-1 receptor without increasing the heart rate. We increase the inotropy without having chronotropy. <clears throat> and it seems that dobutamine, there must be some subset that it works on that it increases the strength of contraction, the inotropy with minimal effects on the chronotropy. Some beta-2 activity might also occur. And again, beta-2s are in your um, um, blood vessels of the muscle. So you get a little bit of afterload reduction that way, but mostly it's effects on inotropy. Now, <laughs> when we give dobutamine, we monitor for, uh, with the ECG because you can still get some spillover tachycardia. Uh, so uh, there, uh, this has to be given as a CRI. It's got a short plasma half-life. So since they're hospitalized to get the CRI, we're gonna go ahead and hook them up to an ECG. Usually they do fine, but it occurs often enough that we want to make sure we're not getting any tachycardia. Here's our goal. We want to raise their systolic blood pressure up uh, above 100, ideally above 120, without causing a tachycardia. Okay. And anesthesia really likes this. Um, when they, uh, the animals are hypotensive, this is not heart failure. This is hypotensive during anesthesia. First thing they're going to do is volume low with fluids or colloids, like hetostarch or saline. If that doesn't work, though, they'll put them on dobutamine and that increased cardiac output will raise the blood pressure, okay? Now there is a peculiarity that's really kind of cool about dobutamine, it's called the dobutamine holiday. Although it's got a short plasma half-life and we give it as a CRI, it actually builds up inside cardiac muscle and it has a prolonged inotropic effect after you stop the CRI. It will last for days or a week or two uh, and that's called a dobutamine holiday, all right? So uh, once you go through the, uh, uh, the loading process of the CRI, the benefit continues after you stop the drug. I had a uh, family friend who had bad dilated cardiomyopathy, and he would uh, decompensate, uh, go into the VA, they put him on a dobutamine drip for uh, a day or two. He'd compensate, he'd go home. Then next month, he'd repeat the process. All right, so that's a dobutamine holiday. Did you have a? Yeah, is this something that you could give if you gave too much ACE promazine or no? Um, <clears throat> would this help in an ACE promazine overdose where you've got vasodilation? It would help uh, indirectly by increasing cardiac output. Uh, more commonly, first we're going to fluid load. That's the first thing we do in a scenario like that. If they're under anesthesia, I might give dobutamine. You certainly could do it. Uh, wouldn't be anything wrong, but I'll talk about dopamine as the next thing that we might consider instead. All right. So, so um, Again, systolic heart failure is probably the most common cardiovascular disease you'll deal with. <coughs> um, 
Again, mitral valve disease in small dogs, dilated cardiomyopathy more in large dogs. And we've addressed uh, decreasing preload and afterload or combinations thereof as, as big therapeutic objectives. And now we're talking about inotropes, increasing the force of contractility. And we just finished talking about dobutamine, which is a, a very good inotrope, um, a lot of good things about it. Uh, people get it a little confused with dopamine. Uh, dopamine is an inotrope, but it's not used that much just for heart failure. And let me explain. Um, <clears throat> dobutamine just affects a subset of beta receptors. Okay. Now, the subset part is important for dobutamine and for this. If it was just a simple matter of stimulating beta receptors, you could just give epinephrine and get a positive inotropic effect. The problem with a lot of your uh, non-selectives or even your relatively selective standard beta agonists is they increase heart rate. And you don't want to increase heart rate further in a heart failure. It's already too high. So we're looking for stimulation of the beta-1 receptor without increasing heart rate. We're looking for inotropy with minimal chronotropy effects, okay? So that's dobutamine. <laughs> now, where does dopamine come in? Dopamine, uh, and it is a different drug, don't get it confused. Uh, dopamine actually stimulates several different receptors. And it has what we call a therapeutic window, which is kind of unique. A therapeutic window implies it only works within a range of concentrations or doses. Now, it, it's kind of intuitive that you'd have a minimal dose to be effective, but what's a little less intuitive is that at higher doses you run into problems. So higher doses don't necessarily lead to a benefit, so we have to work within that range. And we have three basic uh, doses that we use depending on what we're trying to achieve, all right? So on the lower end of our dosage spectrum, uh, we get stimulation of the beta-1 receptor. And this increases the positive inotrope effect, and that's why we're talking about it here in heart failure, okay? But uh, we also get stimulation of the dopamine receptor, okay? Uh, <coughs> that also kind of you, you're getting into the intermediate doses there. Now why is that important? Uh, peripherally, in, the dopamine receptors in humans are in the renal artery and the splanchnic vessels. Splanchnic meaning uh, visceral, intestine, uh, that sort of thing, okay? Now there are dopamine receptors in the brain, but this dopamine won't cross the blood-brain receptor, so it doesn't have any effect on brain dopamine. <coughs> But why is this? These vasodilate those vessels, all right? And so, truthfully, the biggest use of dopamine is not for heart failure, it's for kidney failure, renal failure, okay? And the reason we use it is that when you have an acute renal failure, if they're oliguric or aneuric, meaning they're producing little or no urine, that's got a horrible prognosis. Basically, they're gonna die unless you do uh, dialysis. <coughs> so, uh, but if we can convert them from an oliguric renal failure to a polyuric renal failure, if there are enough nephrons surviving, they can lead a compensated renal failure life, okay? So they're in renal failure, but with proper care, they can keep them uh, as reasonably good quality of life. So we do that a couple of different ways. We're going to replace any fluid deficits, volume load them, so they have plenty of fluid. Again, not heart failure. They already got too much fluid in heart failure. We're talking about acute renal failure here, so I'm diverging just a little bit. Uh, <coughs> and then we'll use furosemide and other diuretics to try to get them to use urine. 
but when that fails, we'll give them a dopamine CRI to try to vasodilate the renal artery, improve GFR, and produce urine. So you'll see this used in dogs uh, when other therapies have failed to produce urine. Now, it's controversial. A lot of people believe that it, cats don't have dopamine receptors in their renal artery, so this tends to be used more for dogs than for cats. Okay, now, uh, there's a third use for dopamine, and that's at the high dose. At the high dose, you start stimulating alpha receptors, okay? So that causes vasoconstriction. Again, in heart failure, not a good thing. That is increasing your afterload, so which we don't want to do. But where you will see dopamine, I talk about it uh, in a few slides down, as a vasopressor to raise blood pressure in the hypotensive animal. So we kind of have three uses. We have inotropy, which usually dobutamine is used instead. We'd only use it if, uh, for uh, inotropy if we had one of these other conditions that we were uh, treating. We have the uh, effects on the renal artery for renal failure patients. That's the, probably the major use and we can use it as a vasopressor to raise blood pressure, okay? But from heart failure, uh, it would be the incidental inotropy effect, okay? Uh, again, real short half-life, so it's given by a constant IV infusion, but unlike dobutamine, it does not accumulate in heart failure. There is no dopamine holiday like there is a dobutamine holiday. But still, it is an inotrope, so I wanted to cover it here. So lesser used uh, compared to dobutamine. Now, the mainstay inotrope, the one that you will use by far the most is pemavenin, trade name Betmedin. Okay, it's an oral inotrope, uh, fairly rapid onset so that you can use it both in the hospitalized and the outpatient setting. Okay. It's called an enodilator because it does two things. It's an inotrope, it's an ino, and dilator is a vasodilator. Okay. So <laughs> the, they think the inotropy, the force of contraction, is from calcium sensitization. So inside the myocyte, it becomes more responsive to the levels of calcium that are there and greater contractility. The phosphodiesterase uh, acts on cyclic AMP to cause vasodilation. It's kind of like the beta-2 receptor in that regard. Not the same mechanism exactly, okay? <clears throat> so we get two benefits. We get the inotropic effect and we decrease preload and afterload. So it has a lot of nice things about it. So it, it's a really good, good drug and pretty well tolerated. Now, I've added this little sentence here so, so you're aware. It is potentially prone to drug interactions. These other drugs, theophylline, which is a bronchodilator, sildenafil, which is Viagra, we use for pulmonary hypertension, and pentoxlifen, uh, which we use as an anti-inflammatory hemorrhologic. You don't understand those terms yet on the hemorrhologic, uh, <coughs> but I'll discuss it in a subsequent le lecture. But these all work on phosphodiesterases, so we try to be careful in combining these. All right, uh, another thing, um, absorption depends on having a relatively low gastric pH so you don't typically want to use acid suppressors if you can avoid it, okay, uh, when you give oral uh, pemibenin. All right, so pemibenin you're going to use in 95% of your systolic heart failures. Now, this is replaced digoxin. You still may use dobutamine and pemibenin, okay, particularly if blood pressure is low. 
we'll add the two together. Dr. Moran, the cardiologist, uh, I think I mentioned I spoke with him, and he will oftentimes start the worst ones on both dobutamine and pimibenin, uh, and then he'll take them off the dobutamine uh, in a day or two and go just with the pimibenin. All right. But the oldest inotrope was the joxin. Where does that play a role, or does it? Okay, and the joxin has a really old, old history. It, it's probably one of the very first drugs. You recall back from the history lecture, I want to say this was somewhere in the late 1600s, Dr. William Weathering discovered that the foxglove plant uh, was beneficial in dropsy, which was a name for ascites. All right, and it's eventually uh, the digitalis glycosides were isolated as the active ingredient. And out of the foxglove, we get three digitalis glycosides. Okay, uh, one is Wabane. I like the name; it's kind of cool, uh, <laughs> but it's extremely toxic. Uh, all of these have relatively th low therapeutic indexes. Wabane is, has such a low, we don't use it. The only time I've seen Wabane used was in an actual disease model where they wanted to cause cardiac arrhythmias. So they use Wabane because it's so toxic. Okay. But uh, digitoxin and digoxin both uh, are used therapeutically, okay? Now, uh, they're similar in some respects in terms of their benefit. They differ in a lot of other respects. <coughs> now, in veterinary medicine, we mainly use digoxin, and we wouldn't use that today. If this was discovered today, we'd use digitoxin instead of digoxin. Why would we do that? What's the difference? Okay. D digitoxin has a lot of nice things about it. Okay. It is lipid soluble, whereas digoxin is water soluble. That, what that means in part is digitoxin can be uh, dosed on whole body weight. All right. Digoxin being water soluble has to be dosed on lean body weight. So <clears throat> you have to make kind of a guess relative to how fat that animal is. You get lean body weight. And also, if he's got ascites, that has to be taken into account. So it's harder to guess the proper dosage, not guess, but derive the proper dosage for digoxin. And it's really easy for digitoxin. Another thing is digitoxin is removed primarily by the liver, whereas digoxin is removed by the kidney. Now, why is that important? Remember, the kidney GFR is a reflection of cardiac output in most instances. So as your disease waxes and wanes with your therapy or natural progression, your GFR changes, therefore your rate of elimination of digoxin changes. All right. In digitoxin, we don't have to worry about that. So <clears throat> why in the world do we use digoxin instead of digitoxin? And it's because we're used to using it before therapeutic drug monitoring came along. Okay. <clears throat> now we measure these plasma concentrations of either drug and adjust our dose. We couldn't do that. Again, this dates back into, you know, the 16, 1700s. The way um, we did this, it turns out digoxin has a toxicity sign that digitoxin doesn't. A certain percentage, a fairly high percentage of uh, animals on digoxin get GI side effects when they get toxic. So they get vomiting, diarrhea, or more commonly anorexia from digoxin that you don't see with digitoxin. So before therapeutic drug monitoring, what we actually did, and I remember doing this, is you kept increasing the dose of digoxin until you saw signs of toxicity. 
So when the dog went off feed, starting getting GI signs, he was borderline toxic, and then you backed off to the dose right before that. All right. So that's how we used to use uh, digoxin. Now we don't have to do that. We use therapeutic drug monitoring. All right. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, why? Well, we have two benefits from digoxin. It is an inotrope, and it's kind of a cool classic mechanism. It poisons or inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase pump inside the cell. Uh, that leads to uh, an increase in calcium. Basically, you get uh, a, a buildup of sodium inside the cell, then there's a sodium calcium pump that exchanges that so you get more calcium inside the cell. So the increased calcium leads to greater contractility strength. Uh, but we said pimabinin is better. The one thing that digoxin does that none of our other inotropes do is they sensitize the barrier receptors, the pressure receptors, mainly in the carotid artery, carotid artery. And when those are stimulated, you get a reflex increase in parasympathetic uh, tone and that slows conduction at the AV node, so you slow the heart rate. So again, when we get these high heart rates that are interfering with diastolic filling, our preferred way to do it in a systolic heart failure is to add digoxin. And the fact that it's an inotrope is good. We'll use pimabinin and digoxin together. Now, one thing I'll just mention, if uh, pimabinin is not inexpensive, it's, it's okay, most owners can afford it, but digoxin is really cheap if, if uh, they can't, and it is an inotrope. Okay, so the niche role now for digoxin is controlling the, heart, the uh, tachycardia. Now, uh, it has a long half-life, around 24, 30 hours, so, uh, <coughs> It takes a while to, to reach steady state. <laughs> now, when we need an uh, immediate onset, we'll give a loading dose. But a lot of people, because of the therapeutic index, are a little uncomfortable with that. So if it's not an emergency situation, they'll do what they call slow digitalization, slow oral digitalization, where they just give the maintenance dose but realize it's going to take about a week to have its maximum effect, okay? <coughs> um, again, dose on lean body weight. Now, overdoses, I've said, cause GI side effects, mostly anorexia and vomiting, and cardiac arrhythmias, okay? The other reason we use therapeutic drug monitoring instead of clinical signs, again, dosing them into a toxicity, is a substantial number of dogs that got ditch toxic did not get GI side effects. So they would develop cardiac arrhythmias that could be life-threatening without showing our telltale GI problems. So we didn't know they were getting toxic. Okay. So now uh, we no longer dose them into toxicity and back off. We use therapeutic drug monitoring. And I'll just kind of go through this uh, rapidly because we talked about this last semester with the calculations and therapeutic drug monitoring. But again, long half-life, so about seven days to steady state. Ideally, if we're interested in toxicity, we look at peak concentrations, which uh, with oral is somewhere between two to five hours post-dosing, okay? So they, uh, you got the dog on digoxin, could be a cat, but systolic heart failure is relatively rare in cats. So you got the dog on digoxin and he stops eating, okay? Did he get in the garbage can or is he ditch toxic? All right, so you look at your peak concentrations and see how high they are. 
we look at trough concentrations relative to efficacy. We want them above a certain point in order to make sure that it's being effective. And that's your range. I will not ask you the range, but you see we've got a, a minimum, and this is nanograms per mil, not micrograms, so it's really potent. Uh, we want them above 0.9 and typically not over two. Now some people argue the dog can tolerate up to 2.5. But we've got this range. You remember this, hopefully old doses to existing concentration is new doses to desired. So you've got your, your dose you're using, you draw your concentration, and you drive your new dose. Now that's peak and trough. With a long half-life, you, uh, you may not see that much difference in peak and trough. That's the ideal. So a lot, what a lot of cardiologists do now is what they call eight-hour post-pill testing. So they'll draw a single sample at eight hours, and if it falls in this range, they figure it's probably therapeutic and not toxic. So eight-hour post-pill testing is, um, is a recommendation by the cardiologists these days. A couple of other things, dobies, this is not hard signs, but dobies seem more sensitive to the ditch toxicity. So I tend to be a little less aggressive when I start out dosing on a Doberman pincher. Normally this is a BID dose, I might start him on a once a day dose on a dobie. Again, renal function affects the elimination. So concomitant renal disease obviously affects it, but remember your cardiac output is changing as this disease progresses. So it, in a heart failure, it is not a once and done therapeutic drug monitoring. You're gonna need to bring them in every few months depending on how rapidly the disease is progressing and reassess those digoxin concentrations. Now, there's a direct relationship between potassium and digoxin's effects. Uh, <clears throat> hypokalemia, low potassium, increases the risk of toxicity. They're actually, high potassium enhances its effect to some degree, but we don't use that. That's just kind of a little additional. <clears throat> but remember, a lot of these dogs are on Lasix, on furosemide, which tends to wash out potassium. <laughs> and we actually have to put a lot of these on potassium supplements when they're on uh, furosemide. Now when we add spironolactone, that, that is a potassium sparing diuretic, so we have to kind of look at both then. But if you're seeing signs of digoxin toxicity, make sure they're not hypokalemic. And I would advise in most instances where you're bringing them in to recheck them, run electrolytes and see what their potassium is, see if they need to, uh, uh, to get a supplement. If they get arrhythmias, uh, then we'll um, uh, stop the dose for a little while, let them get subtoxic. We treat as necessary, mostly lidocaine if they uh, really need treating. All right. Uh, and actually, again, potassium has a benefit if they're marginally low on their potassium and they have arrhythmias, we'll supplement their potassium and that will decrease our arrhythmia somewhat too. Now, if it's life-threatening, they're throwing PVCs left and right and, and you're really concerned about them, there is a human anti-digoxin uh, antibody fragment that can instantly reverse a digoxin toxicity. All right. So it's a rescue drug, really nice if you get a life-threatening one. Most of the time, we don't use it because we're able to just treat them symptomatically and ride it out until the drug is eliminated. Uh, but remember that, it, well, you're just now getting toxicology, right? Or you're, you will? It's coming up, all right. They'll talk to you, Dr. Uh, Gaunt, uh, we'll talk to you about some of the poisonous plants and one of them is oleander that has cardiac glycosides in it. So it could be used in an oleander toxicity if I'm remembering correctly. And if you practice in Florida, you may run into cane toad toxicity. Cane as in sugar cane, all right. This is a toad that unfortunately somehow got into the U.S. and now 
is wreaking havoc because unlike regular toad, regular toad, a dog runs up, grabs a toad in Mississippi, and he'll probably spit it out and he'll foam for a little while. All right. These cane toads create or secrete a digoxin-like or digitalis-like toxin in their secretions that cause cardiac arrhythmias and seizures. This particular toxin crosses the blood-brain barrier. So we're actually using anti-digoxin antibody for cane toad toxicity. It is expensive, it's the only drawback. 